I want you to sit right here. You can be on my own, okay? No, no, no. <laughs> okay. 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 Say it, huh? Can you perch over there? Can you be quiet? Can you be quiet? Can you perch? Yeah, good girl. We have a special guest. Yeah. I love that. I don't know if she's going to look For all the children that will be watching, it will be something fun for them. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's wonderful for all of us. We have the bunny in the next room, but he doesn't like to get picked up. And I'm just, <laughs> and he's very, he's quite heavy. So this one, I, Joe's going to be on the standby if she gets rowdy <laughs> to take her. She can go uh, be speed with a bunny if uh, she gets rowdy. You're not going to do that, are you? No. Okay, Stephanie, go ahead. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. It is wonderful to see you. We're so glad you were able to join us here today for this special virtual Norman Rockwell Museum program. I'm Stephanie Plunkett, Deputy Director and Chief Curator, and it has been a pleasure to work with Jan Brett on Stories Near and Far, her exhibition featuring more than 120 original artworks from 17 of her amazing books that will be on view in our galleries through March 6th. A gifted and passionate storyteller with more than 40 million books in print, Jan Brett is one of America's most celebrated and widely read author illustrators for children. Her global perspective, which is central to her work, is inspired by her appreciation for world cultures and her many travel experiences, which have taken her from the Arctic Circle to South America and to countries in Europe, Africa, Asia, and beyond. Today, Jan is joining us. Uh, to share special her thoughts about her work and inspirations. And she'll also be doing a reading of Cozy, her tale about an Alaskan, Alaskan muskox. And I think she'll also be able to tell you a little bit about its upcoming sequel, Cozy in Love, which she is currently working on. Jan will also take you through the process of creating one of her beautiful watercolor illustrations. And we hope if you're able, that while you're listening and watching, that you can create your own artwork as well. Please do send along your questions and comments in the chat feature. Jan looks forward to answering them at the end of the program, and uh, we will bring them forward to her. Many thanks to Jan's husband, Joe Hearn, who is behind the scenes there. He is an accomplished musician at the Boston Symphony Orchestra, and he has been a great help throughout. And we're also very grateful to our sponsors, the Max and Victoria Dreyfus Foundation and the Ruth, Ruth Krauss Foundation for helping to make the exhibition possible. And with that, it's a great pleasure to turn the program over to Jan. Welcome, Jan. We are so happy to have you. Thank you, Stephanie. It's wonderful to be here. And probably one of the crowning moments of my life is walking into your beautiful Norman Rockwell Museum and seeing my artwork next to one of the icons of the illustrating and artist world, Norman Rockwell, and someone I've greatly admired since I was a little girl and still, and he's never lost his, his place on the throne as an illustrator and artist. And um, I hope if everyone can just find a place in their schedule to go to the museum, it's the most beautiful place, very cozy set in a lovely area of Stockbridge, Massachusetts that's just, there's teeming with art things to do and cultural things to do. And the museum is one of the crown jewels. So I hope you all have a chance to go there. And it's the one place I've ever had all the pieces of artwork from a book um, framed and on display. It was just, it was breathtaking for me because it takes me a year to do a book. It's part of my life. And then to see it 
uh, on the walls of a museum is, um, I don't know how to explain the feeling, but I, ever since I was a little girl, I wanted to be an illustrator. And if you asked me, if you went into my kindergarten class and said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would have said, children's book illustrator. And it took a little while to get there. I went to museum school in Boston, but always was coloring. And thanks to my um, parents who always gave us lots of art materials and great sisters who would spend hours drawing, not too much TV, had lots of animals. And slowly but surely, I started um, illustrating. And when I went out to get a job, there was an editor, Houghton Mifflin, Walter Lorraine, and he saw my art portfolio and he said, but Jan, you know, we'll have to wait till we get a story that will match your artwork. Had you ever thought of writing your own story? And I had not, I didn't think of myself as a writer at all. So I, and he said, you know, Jan, there's only like 10 plots and are you good at telling stories? And I said, well, I'm okay at telling stories. So I started out with Fritz and the Beautiful Horses, which was based on my daughter learning to ride horses. And I've kind of continued that theme of my animals kind of sometimes spark some kind of funny incident or um, uh, 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 a story that I can then make into children's book. She's distracting me. She was, she, this is the kind of thing that happens. <laughs> so cozy, I went to Alaska to visit my daughter. Leah and she said mom you know there's this muskox farm an hour away from Anchorage and she knew I loved the Pleistocene which like the era of like 30,000 years ago when megafauna roamed the north um, regions of the United States so that would be woolly mammoth saber-toothed cats um, arctic all these arctic animals short-faced bears was one and the muskox the muskox is the one that still exists today. It kind of looks like an um, Arctic goat. It's a very unusual animal and they were hunted in, into extinction in the 1920s. And then there was this man, John uh, Teal from Vermont who brought them back. He got 37 from Greenland where they still existed and brought them back and they have a farm there where they comb the kiviet, which is their very um, exotic fiber, because exotic because it's so warm and beautiful. And uh, that this uh, farm is where we went and got to see them. Because if you're gonna draw something, you might as well know what it looks like. <laughs> and the internet is great. Uh, my reference books are terrific too, but there's nothing like seeing a musk ox or being chased by one um, to really get to know what they're like. So I'm going to read you Cozy and give you a few tidbits that only the artists could know about. And um, any of you that want to be illustrators, I think you'll get right on board because you'll know that often your artwork is drive, driven by your curiosity. And that's what happened with my book, Cozy. So here's the jacket. And this little girl right here, Ricoletta, she's in another one of my books. I thought it would be fun for the children to see one of my animals and um, she's gonna sit right there until she misbehaves. So this is the jacket of Cozy and you can see the Northern Lights, which I put there because I want to, my editor said, you need some color in this book. And then you'll see there, here is the end papers. Another chance I can add a little bit of my interest in where, whatever country I'm in. And these are some of the lichens that are found on the rocks around Alaska. Um, in the tundra and I have this great huge lichen book and I was had great fun seeing them in for real in the summer in the winter they're covered with snow and um but I got to put them in the end papers <laughs> so we, cozy begins <sighs> storms rolled over the tundra when cozy the muskox was separated from his herd he was used to being with his family his mother and father had named him Cozy because his silky coat was so soft and thick. Cozy braced himself against the wind and his thick coat warmed him like a blanket. So I, I'm gonna show you that I've put little border pictures in and sometimes I have too many ideas and I can put them in the borders and I can also foretell what is coming next. 
And if you look on the right hand side, there's a little lemming family there, another Arctic animal. And I have not seen one in real life, only at the Museum of the North, where I did some more research that is in Fairbanks and saw some taxidermied lemmings. On with a story. In a tussock, a mother lemming's pups were squeaking loudly. It's cold, it's cold, it's cold. She used a triple carry to tunnel them toward a new spot where she saw a towering mountain of fur. You know what that is gonna be. It's cozy. In no time, the lemming family settled in next to Cozy's left hoof. She whispered, quiet voices, and that muskox will never notice us. And so um, the next page, uh, oh, on that page, you can see a rabbit is coming next. It's Snowshoe Hare. Snowshoe Hare, feeling chilly, had the same idea. Master Muskox, he asked politely, may I wait out the storm under the protection of your very thick coat? Cozy was happy for the company and well aware that a lemming family had snuck in. He said, welcome, Snowshoe Hare, but mind those lemmings, quiet voices, and gentle thumping only. So remember I was saying Walter Lorraine had told me there's only like 10 plots. Well, this is there's the only room for one more that you see in many different cultures. And the mitten was my most beloved book, I think, that it's the same idea of one animal getting into a small place until there's too many. And then that's when the, um, we have to solve the problem. Well, the artist does anyway. <laughs> and um, I do all of that in my book dummy. Oh, here it is. This is like a small version of my book that I do. First, I write it out on the computer or I do it longhand. Then it goes on the computer and I check it out with my um, editor and she's wonderful. And we talk about, um, the subject matter, whether it's a winter book, Christmas book, and um, the trim size, which is the dimensions. This is a small one because it only takes me three weeks to do. And uh, I'll put the type that I'll cut up the type. Picture books are always 32 pages. So this one is 32 pages. And I can look at the whole Oliver thing and think, is the arc to the story, is it satisfying? Is it exciting enough? Is it cozy enough? when it comes to this one. And the answer was yes, but I did a few changes and on not on this dummy, but some of them have all kinds of like little comments from my editor and art director. The editor takes care of the words, the art director takes care of um, the artwork. So an example might be, she might say, this rabbit's uh, face is a little bit too close to the fold and you wouldn't be able to see it. So then I might move it over. That's the kind of comment she would make. And the kind of comment Susan would make, the editor, is she might say, well, she didn't like, it was a triple carry. This is when Mother Lemming was taking her babies. Um, but I, I said, no, I really want it. So she let me. So I can do that sometimes. But I always listen to her. She's had a lot of experience. And it's always good to get a different perspective. So it's a little bit like if you were a student and you were writing a story and your teacher was looking at it, she might give you some com constructive criticisms. And then you would try to make up your own mind about whether you felt that that was indicative of the, the mood that you wanted to create in your story. So it's a back and forth all the time. And that's why that dummy is so helpful. The next page, I love this one. Snow swirled and poof, suddenly all grew white. Was it a clump of snow that had hit Cozy on the forehead? No, it was feathers. When Cozy opened his eyes, he was looking into big yellow ones. And it turns out it's a, it's a snowy owl, one of my favorite birds. The eyes belong to a snowy owl who also had a request. Oh, magnificent ooming Mac, would you be so kind to give me shelter? The wind has tumbled me terribly. Cozy knew that snowy owls and lemmings and snowshoe hares were not always fast friends, but he agreed wisdom conditions. House rules are quiet voices, gentle thumping, claws to yourself. So now I'm starting to set up that the animals, is there a question about are they going to behave under there underneath Cozy? How, what's, what's going to work? And so Cozy sets up those rules. 
And you might notice the borders. I couldn't use the indigenous artwork from the Alaskan people because it, they all, it has meanings, family meanings. They, it's from coming from the outside, I would feel funny using it, but I would use some of the materials that they used. And one is abalone shells, which are, there is a certain abalone that is in Alaska and it was used as traded, very, very beautiful. So this is a necklace or part of a necklace that I got um, in Alaska. And I use that as some of the a border idea and some like little blue trade beads, which I thought would be okay. And so that um, was every book. I kind of try to find something that has to do with the place it comes from to put in the borders. And it has a little circle and you can see there's like little horns on the top of each of the little border elements. On to the story. Oh, I should say that one of the things that they, I always love to do books with snow. And I don't, every other book is probably snow and the others are not snow, but everyone likes the snow ones better. And I have a theory about why that is. I think because my artwork is so detailed and busy that the white snow gives your eyes a chance to look at the characters and that's appealing to people. Now my editor and art director were always complaining that because I do Arctic books and Arctic animals are always gray, brown, white, that I need more color. That is why I put the Northern Lights in so I could get some color in my book to make them happy. Because when I was a little girl, I liked, I didn't necessarily have to have bright colors to make me like a book. I just, I like the authenticity part. Arctic Fox's nose was turning blue. Her bushy tail wasn't warm enough. And every time she wrapped it around herself, the wind unwrapped it. Thinking Cozy would make a good windbreak, she sidled up to him. Do you mind, Mr. Buskbox, if I unfreeze my nose in your thick fluff? Cozy was happy to welcome a new guest, but eyeing her sharp canines, he answered, for the harmony of all, quiet voices, gentle thumping, claws to yourself, and no biting. On the side, you can see a wolverine, and here is where I use my artistic artistic license. He has fallen into a lead in the ice, which is a big crack where the water comes up. One thing that's very special about the uh, wolverine is that their fur, nothing can stick to it. It's just so shiny and slick, but I wanted to have him covered with ice balls. So I a little bit fudged it with that. As winter went by, the storms grew worse. The wind blew and blew and a low, humpy shape appeared, swaying and shuffling. His coat was covered with ice balls. So you and I know that probably that wouldn't happen in real life. Shaggy beast, it growled. I fell into an ice flow, and I'm chilled to the bone. Can you help me? Cozy was happy to invite the wolverine in, but he added the house rules. Quiet voices, gentle thumping, claws to yourself, no biting and no pouncing. Cozy's new friends cleaned their coats, preened their feathers, napped, and were glad for their com comfy shelter. This is one of my favorite pages. And I had originally wanted a flap so that you saw Cozy with his fur and you could pick up the flap and see all the animals underneath. And in order to do this page, I had to go up to the muskox arm and lift up, they call it a skirt of this, these long guard hairs that almost touch the ground. And you can see under the muskox and muskoxes are semi-domesticated. So it's not something you wanna do without having one of the muskox experts with you. And they have, you know, white little legs. And so it was a good thing I got to see under there. So I could make, that, make sure that that leg was really the color of muskox leg. But then above the wind, the animals heard, yip, 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 yip. A team of huskies, always on the lookout for a good thing, barreled into Cozy's big bulk, flinging the animals in all directions. This reminds me a little bit of the mitten where they get flung in all directions too. But it's kind of fun to draw animals. I mean, it's easy to draw them from the side as if it comes from a guidebook, but to have them twisting and turning in space. Now that takes artistic talent. 
their musher, a sea otter, looked on in dismay. And I have to admit, I just wanted a chance to draw a sea otter. They've got to be one of the cutest animals ever. Although the baby muskox is probably the cutest. And you can see the muskox's um, sleigh that is um, on, on the side there. So these huskies are going to really be troublesome because the muskox is pretty much without predators except for wolves and man. And a husky is a very much like a wolf. Any of you husky owners know that there's certain behaviors that huskies have that make you think, hmm, they're probably not that far from their ancestors. Hi, the lead dog grinned. House rules, course, the jostled lemming, lemming, snowshoe hare, snowy owl, arctic fox, and wolverine. Quiet voices, gentle thumping, claws to yourself, no biting, no pouncing, and be mindful of others. Cozy, weary of the lead dog who looked a lot like a wolf, shook, shook, shook his horns to make sure the huskies understood. So this is um, my friend Lee Sarah's husky, but um, we had a husky perky pumpkin and she's appeared in some of my other books, like the first dog in a, in a certain different guise, not exactly like her, but her, her expressions. And then this, this, this scene changes a little bit because spring is coming. So I'm trying to show that in the sky where you're getting the light um, is coming up instead of being all dark. As time went by, the wind calmed a little and the Arctic sun climbed higher in the sky. The animals felt more at home every day, but Cozy has spring fever. I want to find my family. How can I move about with all these visitors underfoot? So this was a fun page to do because I could draw them being kind of it kind of pesky and not behaving well. The owl's perched on his horn, for example. The Arctic fox is draped over the boss, that place where his horns are joined. And people are taking naps on his fur. And, you know, how can he go and eat? What they do is they dig under the snow for sedges and grass and young willows. And that's what they'll be eating. The house wolves were stretched every day. When was a nibble a bite? When was a hoot quiet or loud? There was bumping, making faces, and no one was saying, I'm sorry. Now, one of my happiest times is going to schools and talking to classrooms. And I've noticed in the last couple of years, these wonderful posters are just about being kind to others and just ways to um, have good behavior and how to fix problems. In, in simple ways. And so I kind of was inspired by those posters when I talked about how bumping, making faces and not saying you're sorry can kind of make it not a happy place. So it's got a little bit moralistic on that page, <laughs> but it does, it has a little bit of a theme there that I'm continuing on. One sunny day, the lemmings were playing climb the ladder. A great chunk of Cozy's coat came off. Then another hand came off Snowy Owl's talons. Cozy remembered this from last year. Shedding meant he, it was finally spring in Alaska. Hank by Hank, all of Cozy's warm, silky winter coat drifted down the slope. And this is one of the hardest things to illustrate in a children's book because this really happens. I actually brought some kitty at home from the muskox farm. And this falls off in huge hanks and drifts over the tundra. And um, it actually, muskox is a misnomer. They actually smell really good. It smells delicious. And they can make, um, this is actually a hat that was knit from Kiviet. It's got little muskox that's knitted in. This is not muskox, but this is the warmest fiber on earth. And so this is, you know, it's hard to make people believe, well, it can just come off in these huge hanks. And then I got to show the Arctic hair, which changes color from pure white to brown in the summer. And the Arctic fox, which turns from white to brown or gray in the summer and, or reddish. And um, I was able to see the Arctic hair in real life when we went up to Fairbanks. It was hopping by the train ride when we took the train station. And the Arctic fox I saw and the wolverine I saw at the Museum of the North. Cozy's lodgers started heading to their spring homes. Cozy hadn't felt so free and breezy since he was a calf. 
kind of like when we take our shoes off in the summer and get to put on our flip-flops. He jumped, he gambled, and then in the middle of a gleeful leap, he saw his herd. So now Cozy is up in the air, probably three or four feet from the ground. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you should see these muskox cavorting around on the muskox farm. They butt each other, they uh, make noise, they fly, they sit down on their haunches, they play king of the castle, which is getting in the highest place they can get and standing there. And they um, are quite agile and they can gallop quite quickly. So um, ox is kind of a misnomer too, because they are um, a really more like a goat. They're kind of cross between a goat and a sheep. He ran to join his mother, his father, his sister, and his brother. Where were you? We were worried, said his sister Fluffy. We missed you, said his brother Snuggly. I made some new friends, Cozy told them, but it was nice to get back to Muscat's ways. And I got to draw my favorite, which is the baby Muscat. In order to have him have horns, he had to be like four years old in the book. So rather than having him a little young a muskox, I had to make him like a teenager. They all formed a circle, babies in the middle. And this is really true. That's how they protect themselves. They form a circle and they put the babies in the middle and the horns on the outside. And when I did my research, I have this book right here. It is by... David Gray, he's a biologist, and I found out all the, you know, he's got maps of where they live and their life cycle and all kinds of interesting tidbits. And uh, I found they call that a rosette. That's what he calls it when they all circle around. Not interesting. They all formed a circle, babies in the middle, but Cozy felt curiously alone. Then the breeze carried squeaky and growly and whistling voices. See you next year, Cozy. Meet you when the snow flies, Cozy. The snow, the snowshoe hare, thump, 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 as they all called. We can't wait to get Cozy with Cozy. So that's the happy ending. He's got a reunion all set for next winter. <laughs> so I would like, I'm, I'm very proud of this book because I'm, I've just been stunned by this animal that I had only seen in books and to actually see it in real life was a, a big thrill. If you ever go to Alaska, it's on the tour. Um, it's quite near Anchorage and it's very interesting what they do there. They're very kind to the animals and uh, they have huge pasturage and they have what they need most, snow. That's their habitat. So I'm going to draw you a picture and I'm going to mostly describe what I'm doing and then hold it up. And you probably saw my dummy. This is more of a cartoon style. But I use watercolors when I, um, I'm doing my artwork. You, if you go to the museum, you'll see it. Look, it's, I use a very fine brush. It almost looks like colored pencil. So it's not the traditional watercolor approach. But, but so that the, you can see it on camera, I'm just going to use one of these little markers to just do the outline. I would not do that. I would do it in pencil if I was doing my artwork, like I'll be doing all this week uh, on my new book. So I'm going to draw his largish, um, massive head. It actually is like almost a ruff that comes back. Um, they will be able to withstand below 50 degrees, zero, but before, below zero for a couple of weeks. I mean, it's really, really cold. And they have what's called brown fat. It's like a kind of, when they store their fat, like a grizzly bear might do the same thing. Um, eat in the summer and put on weight, and then they'll be able to utilize that in, if they're having hard times. They don't live in the deep snow. They have, their hooves are specially designed by God, I guess, nature, so that they can um, dig through the ice and they actually will use their butt of their um, horns, that boss, to break the ice because they need to get in and get the sedges and willows that are underneath the snowpack. And if it's too icy, they wouldn't be able to do it. And if it's too snowy, I mean, the snow could be, you know, 11, 12 feet deep. That the, those would not be the areas that they would live in. They are kind of in the high Arctic. So I'm going to draw his, this is a male. So they have horns, not antlers, which means that they 
stay on their heads for their whole lives. So when they're babies, they kind of stick out and look really cute. And then the females have almost looks like a Dutch girl. They curve down and they're a little bit smaller, but they still have a hook at the end in case any wolf comes too near. I'm sure they can use their sharp hooves also to protect themselves. But the males, they, the horns hitch right in the front. And then in order to show what a good male um, father they would be, they, they hit each other. They come running at like 30 miles an hour and crash into each other. And then the winner gets to be the, uh, has a harem and the loser goes off to find more female somewhere else. <laughs> or he just hangs out until he gets a little bit stronger. And so I'm going to draw a little outline in my marker of their eye, which is high on their head. The fur around it is a little bit lighter in color. The interesting thing, I'll draw this later when I do a close up um, of the eye. The um, pupil is, is horizontally elongated. So, you know, a snake will have like a vertical and some cats have a vertical pupil and a goat or a muskox is horizontal. So when I went and really saw the muskox, I was getting in my car. Mark, Mark Austin is the um, director of this farm. He oversees everything. And he came running out to the car and he goes, Jan, Jan, before you start your book, just remember, they don't have tails. And he goes, well, I, they really do have tails, but you can't see them. They're just like little. But I guess a lot of people draw muskox with big fluffy tails. They don't have tails. And then, and then he said, and you know, they have elongated pupils in their eyes. And I went, oh, I did not know it. And I, remember, I remembered when I did my book, um, let's see, it was uh, the snow, three snow bears and I had polar bears. And I, I made pink tongues when they had their tongues out. And I, then I went to the Brookfield Museum in Chicago. They were anesthetizing their polar bear for medical reasons. And because I knew the vet there, he invited me to come and see this polar bear that was like now um, asleep. And they had all kinds of precautions, like an escape route and everything, because these are very ferocious animals. And he, his mouth was open and out comes the tongue and it's gray. Turns out that, that a polar bear has black skin it, it enables their, um, their fur, which is like fiber optic, each strand, the sunlight when it is up, comes down there and warms up this black, you know, black absorbs light, the black skin and helps them warm themselves for the, the cold winter. Polar bear is another really amazing animal. And I found out they have gray tongues. So I would have done this whole book with pink tongues. That would have been terrible. So I was very glad that Mark came running out to the car to tell me about their pupils. And I have noticed that goats have that same pupil. So that's why I say it's more like an Arctic goat than an ox. And they, I didn't smell anything bad. And when I went up there, I was able to um, get close, up close and personal with little man, who was this one muskox who had something had happened to his mother or he was a rescue. I don't remember the story. But he, ever since he was a little boy, boy he was um, given a bottle when he was a baby. And then he was semi-habituated. You know, people would pay a special attention to him. So he's like the one that you go to if you want to have your picture taken with. And I, that was a special privilege I got because I was doing the book. And uh, so the first thing I did was like, Patty, he was very friendly. And then I put my nose right in that big fluffy ruff. And it was uh, very good smelling. Smelled a little bit like my husky. The polar bear, on the other hand, smelled like a cross between a wet dog and a fish. Not as good. So here is um, here's the my little sketch of the muskox. I made his head a little bit too big, which is my artistic license. I want these characters to hold your attention and to have personalities. And the more space that I have, you'll see that with a lot of illustrators that they'll make the the animal's head and eye. A little bit bigger because that's where we look to get the signals. What is that creature thinking? Also, I'll do work on the body language. So he's kind of step sitting kind of in a prim way because he's talking to the snowy owl, who is a very fierce bird, but because of its beautiful coloring, it, everyone thinks it's just a 
lovely little sweet bird. But interestingly enough, I live in Boston and they can be sighted at Logan Airport. So if you kind of, in the wintertime, they have certain years that they will come, more and more will come down because there's less lemmings in the Arctic, which is their main food source. And they will come in a, a migration, a small migration. And they love Logan Airport because of this kind of like tundra there. So here I've, I just added the snowy owl in there. And now I'm gonna color in and describe to you what I'm doing. Now these are my, this is my palette and kids always love to go, oh, look at that, it's so messy. And that's what I get to tell them. There's very few colors in nature that are either bright yellow, bright red, bright green. They're often a mixture. So one of the fun activities that you can have, like let's say you're waiting for the bus or you're at your friend's house and you're waiting for them to go in and get an extra sweater. Look at the bark of a tree, look at the ground, the little flowers in the garden and or the dog, the neighbor's dog and see how many colors you can see in this one image because I think you'll be very surprised. You know what my biggest surprise is? When you look out at foliage, so much you see is reflected light. It almost looks white, like a field of grass. You'll have little white. And everybody draws trees as being dark brown or black. But most trees are like have lichens and moss on them. So they have a greenish hue. And every different kind of tree has a different kind of bark. So it pays to be observant. And then when you can back it up with your research, then your pictures will tell a story just by putting a certain kind of bark on your tree. Maybe you could put the, a little bit of fur that an animal got stuck on the bark as it went by. Maybe there's like little lichens there that are special and a beautiful color or could be um, a, a place where a bird has made its nest. And all those things can help with your storytelling. That's what makes it lots of fun to be an illustrator. So here are my brushes. Got a big one because I'm going to just start and color. I'm going to make a bluish. Oh, I'm going to get a smaller brush. You know, I really, it's more like um, colored pencils rather than watercolors. So I don't use black ever. I use dark brown. It's called Van Dyke Brown in the watercolor catalog. And uh, I think it's, I'll tell you what I have to think. And I'm just going to go around the edges and I'll show you of this whole animal just around the edges to give it a three-dimensional look. And so when you decide on your art style, you will be thinking about how, what kind of line you wanna use. Do you want it to be a cartoon? You might just want to use a simple line and fill in with solid colors. If you want a more realistic look, then you want your image to cast a shadow. You want it to look round. And this is where this, um, shading is coming in. I'm just doing this really quickly because normally it takes me an hour to do an inch. I don't think we want to be here for two days. And uh, on that same subject, because a lot of times kids will say, oh, I can never draw as good as you can. I go, well, you know, I've been practicing for 65 years and it takes me an hour to do an inch. And, you know, I am concentrating. That's my whole day is doing, is, is coloring. And so you don't expect results immediately and you can do a little bit at a time. Well, so at the end, when I finish my, my little talk here, I'll tell you a little bit something special about that whole business of spending a lot of time and focusing on your artwork. It's kind of, um, kind of magical. I'm gonna put a little yellow in with the eye. So here's, here's the shadowing. And you can see already, it gives more of a three-dimensional look. Now this part is up to you, your style. Do you want to put lots of details? Maybe not. Maybe you want to use, um, get your point across by um, being paying attention to the line that you're drawing. So um, I'm, uh, I'm one of my favorites is Norman Rockwell. He goes even further than I do. He uses a light to almost his people's faces. They look alive because it's almost as if they're emitting um, light from within because they're live beings. I haven't really progressed to that yet. I still hopefully have a few more years left. And, um, and also the light around him plays on their faces, it shows the planes of their faces. And he uses he used models. And some of the models I actually met because we live in the Berkshires quite near the museum in Tiringham. 
and in the summertime. And um, he used models and photographs. And then he and then his own artistry would build from that. And that's what I'm not quite up to where he is, but I do use uh, modeling. And uh, now I'm going to take my bigger brush. I wouldn't probably even use this so I was doing a book drawing, but I just want to get um, show you some of the techniques because this is kind of the fun part because the more you draw, I did go to museum school, but most of everything I've learned, I've either, it's been a mistake that I fixed and said, oh, maybe that could work in another way. I'll show you an example. So I'm making this uh, sepia, the, the uh, Van Dyke Brown in ultramarine blue, I just remembered. Oops, I got a little bit of a wrong color blue there. Well, it's gonna be more blue than normal. Let's see if I can fix that. I'm working on my palette now, and I'm just blocking in a lot of color. So I wanna show you this fun thing that I'm gonna do. So the rough that he has, it's very, very fluffy. It's so fluffy that the texture of the fur is different than the rest of his body. But it is very telling because you can see, um, get a, you can get a sense of how thick and warm that fur is. So here is the, the, the color that I've locked on. And then I'm gonna take my brush. Remember this, because this is a fun technique. I'm gonna fill, fill the brush with water, just plain clear water. And I'm just gonna drop droplets on his fluffy part. You know, I'm calling it a mane, but that's really not what it is. It's, it's um, his rough is what it is. And what happens is that water kind of dissolves the, the paint from underneath it. And it leaves a really cool splotch. And then I can take a paper towel and make it into a shape with my hands, like a little, and maybe dab into it. And that might create a, a texture too. Some people can, you could use a little sponge or like a, something from your makeup kit if you're a girl. You can see how that makes the, it look almost like it's fur. Okay, so then I got my little brush and I wanna show the beautiful guard hairs, which are, that's not the kiviet. The kiviet is the undercoat. And I'm just can I could spend hours just drawing the, the hair coming down from these, from his long coat that br almost brushes the ground. And oh, if you get on the internet and go to YouTube, you can have pictures of the running um, in the tundra. And there's, they call it a skirt. It's like so silky and it's just so beautiful. And no one sees it because they're so far up north. Very few people ever see a wild musk ox. And then around his eyes, I'm using another color of brown to go around his eyes. And I can use my artistic license to um, make that a little bit of a stronger color so that it gives him more personality. And I always tell people, when you're drawing, pay the most attention when you're drawing the creature's eyes, or it could be a, a robot person, animal, because as human beings, that's where we look to see what the person is thinking. So let's say if I cover up my whole face, make a smile, you can see by my eyes, I'm smiling. You would guess that. So my eyes get a little crinkly and my uh, cheeks go up and make a little, they become crescents, sad. They may be my eyebrows. I get some furrows right there where I have a sad wrinkle and maybe my eyes droop this way, mad. Oh, the eyebrows go down. So all this whole configuration changes and I can take an animal and put human uh, facial expressions in fur um, on the creature and that will help my, bring my story along. So it gets exciting and you, you feel for the character. So now Cozy is um, starting to take shape now. And now here's another trick because this is watercolor and I have special paper that it's kind of, it's not too absorbent. Like if I used a newsprint, I wouldn't be able to do this. They have a little bit of white around their muzzle and also a little saddle on their back. So I'm gonna take a brush that's kind of stiff um, and just take my water and just take that uh, paint off. So I can make that, well, I don't want it to be pure white either. So this works out really well. So I'm gonna make a little saddle, which is what they actually have. Look, they all have like a little white saddle on their back. 
it looks almost like snow has fallen on them. And then also around his muzzle, that's white too. And his little chin. And so now I've taken my uh, clear water, put it on the saddle area, blotted it, and on his muddle, muzzle area and blotted it. It gives me a little shortcut. I don't have to use um, uh, white paint because it's watercolors. Now the snowy owl is a white animal. So I just used a little bit of gray except for his yellow eyes. And then I tried to make him look like a little bit surprised and worried with a small, um, you know what I do? Here's the secret. Put a mirror by your desk. And then when you're putting an animal, you want Co Cozy is looking down at this snowy owl. He's just been hit with it on the forehead. And he's um, thinking, oh, um, what has he got to say? So he's curious, he's intent. And I try to show that expression on him. And the owl, on the other hand, is making this big explanation. And he's a little bit fearful of this great huge buscox. So those are the kind of things that I'm working for in that eye expression. So I'm going to sign it, Jan Brett. So I would hope that you guys, when you do your drawing, you can sign it and put the date, 2000, I mean, February. Because even though I'm a big lady and I have lots of books, in my heart of hearts, I always want each book to be better than the last one. So I always try really hard and sign my work because the more you, you draw, the better that you become. It's just a natural human way to be. We're all artists at heart. And uh, sometimes you have to wait and concentrate and give yourself a little time. I always say, put a kitchen timer for an hour. Get your paper and decide. You can decide beforehand what's going to be, or you can let it unfold. Because I want to tell you this before we go to questions. I'm going to tell you this one last thing. I will work sometimes very late at night. I have these special lights that makes it almost like daytime in here. And I'll work and work and work because no distractions at night. And maybe one o'clock, I'll just say, oh, I'm going, going to bed. And I have been working on this drawing very intensely. The next morning, I'll come down and I have a piece of finished artwork that I've just been working on. This is for Cozy and Love. And uh, it's almost like elves were there because you get concentrating so hard, something else takes over. You're not consciously thinking, oh, now I'm drawing the horn. Now I'm drawing this. All of a sudden, if there's something inside, some people have names for it, they call it your muse. But I always pretend it's like my six-year-old self going, oh, this wouldn't be too good. Or yeah, try this. And it, you almost get in, not a trance, but in a special focus when you're drawing. And it comes naturally. And I hope you let that happen to you because it's made, it, for me, it's, make, it's what makes illustrating um, invigorating, imaginative. Um, it, it makes my life make sense. It's the way, best way I can communicate. I hope you'll give yourself a chance to see if that illustrating views will come and help you along when you're doing your drawing. So I hope that you have some questions for me. Jan, thank you so much. That was absolutely wonderful and so interesting and, and so much fun to see a preview of Cozy and Love also. Uh, <laughs> the work is just beautiful. And we have lots yeah. of questions. Oh, good. Um, yes, yeah, so many. But I, we'll start with a fun one because um, many people were wondering what that beautiful black and white chicken was that you Ooh. were holding, the friend who, who stopped in in the beginning. Okay, I brought the book because I thought you'd think this was fun because I always say... Oh, where is it? Um, I always say that oh, they, a lot of ideas come from my animals. So I have all these chickens. I have, a, a, you know, over a hundred and they're show chickens. They go to chick poultry shows, but my editor knew how much I love chickens. And she said, Jan, how about a chicken Cinderella? This was my editor, our Margaret Brett, who I had for four years. She's a very famous editor. And so Cinders is a chicken. And then when you, it's set in Russia where we, we had the ghoulie research and go to St. Petersburg and had a wonderful time going to, um, to uh, all the sites, no garage where they, they copied some of the old buildings. And so let's see, can I, I'm sure that there is a picture of a white crested boy. So here's a picture of all the different chickens in the book. There's different breeds. But I'm going to go stand up and get Miss Ricoletta. Come here, girl. 
This is the kind that I breed. They're called white crested black Polish. And I have ones that are white crested blue Polish, which are kind of a grayish color, but kind of like a nuthatch, kind of bluish like that. And they're very tame. And then I have a bunny, Little Snow, who appeared in many, many books. The Christmas, um, Easter book, the Easter egg, and also one of my very favorites is called The Animal Santa. And Little Snow is the main character. And Little Snow is now Big Snow. <laughs> I should probably- As I recall, he warned you of a bear outside your window one time. Yes. So in that book, <laughs> there's- but I was in the Berkshires and I heard this huge bang thinking it was a, a limb had come down on our log cabin and I looked all around, could not find it. Now, Little Snow has got a little open area that's high up. It, it, it doesn't have a roof on it. He just stays in there. He's a very good bunny. But it's, there's a window in the back and I couldn't find anything that could have made this noise. And I started working again and all of a sudden, bang. And oh, my gosh. I look over and little snow is like stiff, like he's afraid. And I go, what could this be? I look out the window and there's a bear's face in it. It was a, a, like a teenager, too curious for his own. Thing. <laughs> and so then I got to see the back end of the bear going down the hill, because that's what you usually see in the Berkshires is the bear retreating. So they're not like the bears in Alaska that you have to be a little bit cautious that you don't smell like a tuna fish sandwich or something <laughs> tasty. <laughs> I Thank think you for that are... response. Um, one of the questions that came up a number of times, and I, I'm sure this is going to be a tough one for you to answer, is do you have a favorite book that you have illustrated? Yeah, I have the, I have an answer that I think will resonate with <laughs> all of you artists out there. It's always the one I'm working on because I never know what's going to happen. I mean, I do the dummy. I have my plan, but I have moments in the book that I go, is this going to work? Or, you know, how is this going? And is that, did I lose it? So I was just a little bit like um, Tom Brady. <laughs> you know, every game is like, oh, am I going to do it? And uh, so hopefully I could keep doing it. But uh, it's very exciting to be part of the process, this creative process, because at some point it takes off and stops being me consciously saying, I'm going to do this. There's something that is inherent in human beings that it's a storytelling gene or whatever that that kind of um appears and takes you along for the ride and jan that was norman rockwell's answer too when people would ask him if he had a favorite painting and he'd say mm -hmm. the next one yeah, yeah. so yeah. there's always that hope in the next one which is a because lot of fun it, it, that's wonderful to hear that yes. because i i would like people to know that it is so different than other forms of uh expression like with in a movie you have focus groups and with a children's book it's so and with Norman's paintings it's just him and his interior world interacting and communicating with you know his vision of what he sees around him and what he wants to bring out in his characters faces and I mean I mean that part of his his legacy is what he's chosen to bring out in human beings. And that's why, please go to the museum and see. I, I promise you, when you see these paintings, you'll be, you may get a tear, you may just be just momentarily stunned at the beauty and the um, perception that he has about us human beings when we have so much bad news and negativity in the world to see what he sees in human beings is um, it's a very uplifting experience. But and Jen, I'll just comment that that is how people are receiving your work as well. I mean, the, the opportunity to see the originals, you know, the luminosity of those oh, colors and the details, just exceptional. Um, another question that came up from several listeners was uh, having to do with the publishing industry today. And, um, you know, if people have ideas about books or stories or have been producing them themselves, um, what is the path to presenting their work or maybe finding an outlet for it? Do you have a feeling about that? Well, I can just say my own experience because I'm not really, because I have a publisher already and I have a contract and I have everything set up with my editor and so forth. It, a lot is about sales. They, it is a commercial enterprise. So if you have a wonderful family story, 
that might be the time to self-publish it because this has to appeal to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I have to balance this with um, with my the things that I'm interested in. And um, so there's maybe a Christmas story, which you, I think 40% of the books are sold at Christmas time. Um, I happen to love Christmas, so that's an easy one for me. But um, I would say that I can't imagine doing it without the professionalism of Susan, my editor, and Marika, my art director. I mean, Marika is a design genius. I mean, she will design the display type. She will, um, you know, that there's some sparkly stuff in there that she, that was her idea. Um, she'll have a second pair of eyes. So I don't always have to do what she says, but a lot of times she'll see something that I totally miss or she'll see it as an outside view. My husband, Joe, the same thing because he's a, he loves humor. So he always will, you know, when he, if I can get a laugh out of him, then I'll think this is, this is going well. So I can't imagine not having that um, group of supporters at, at the publisher to help me. And then all of a sudden selling the book and, you know, they are editing and curating it all the time. It's like if somebody, when you mounted the show, I gave you maybe a hundred pieces of artwork and you chose 60 perhaps. Um, and you chose them because they seem to work well with each other. May, probably you could speak to it better than I can, but that's the process that um, the, the publisher will do. Um, is the book uh, going to work with, will teachers like it, will um, children like it? They'll be making all the decisions. And some of them, they there's like no-nos that you wouldn't want to have uh, certain subjects made that aren't appropriate for children, that they that I, all the time I get people sending me manuscripts. And it's amazing, they'll say, why would you ever write read this to a child? It's not that we don't want them to have literature, but, there is, but there's an appropriateness there that is, um, the publisher is very uh, cogent about that. So um, I guess I don't have a very good answer about it. If you did something online, more power to you. I mean, the electronic world is progressing faster than we can even keep up with. So I have, I'm not an expert. I'm actually the opposite. I'm like really Aww. hopeless. <laughs> well, I think your point about online presence is important. We've heard from many artists that sometimes publishers will find them online because of what really? they have seen. So that's changing as well. That it's makes me very astounded. I'm, I'm amazed because what normally I would have done if I was starting out is take my portfolio to New York where yeah. most the publishers are mm -hmm. and I would show them and get feedback from them. And what well, I gave you an example of Walter Lorraine saying there's only 10 plots. And then I had another really interesting experience. I never got a, a publishing job from this company, but the lady said, Jan, you've only got animals in your portfolio. This is, these are children's books, children. And I go, Oh yeah, you're right. And I said, I don't know. I'm very, not very good at people. And she said, well, you're going to have to get good at people. And she, then she said, Jan, Pretend your animals are little people and just unzip their little fur suits. <laughs> and I That's kept a great that. comment. I oh. know. And so I kept that to heart. And I, I kept thinking, well, my animals really are like little surrogate kids. That, um, you know, there's something about an animal that's one step away from a child so that you can read about their ups and downs and their problem solving. And you're not feeling like you can identify with the animal and the animal is fun so i have i would say a lot of my characters are animals but you know speaking of your characters your people characters there's a great question um and it, you know it is said that artists often draw themselves or they're so yes. familiar with their own body type and characteristics <laughs> that they draw themselves so one question was um are you the character of the young girl in the Nutcracker, which is your newest Whoa. published Whoa. book? Or, or do you appear in other places too, maybe? Yeah, it's my granddaughter. Actually, I think the closest I ever came to a self-portrait is in the 12 Days of Christmas, I'm the Goose. <laughs> Someone said, hey, Jan, is that you? And I go, you know, it might be because I, you know, I do the mirror trick. And uh, which reminds me, I just love to give helpful hints because, or, or secrets. 
Um, if you're drawing something and it's not looking quite right to you, now this is, I'm talking to all the young artists out there, take the picture and put it up to a mirror. And it's like looking at it for the first time because it's reversed. And it will, you might see something you haven't seen when it's just, you're just uh, creating it yourself as it's unfolded because you know your eyes adjust to it. It might be something as simple as one eye being too, higher than the other. Maybe the body is leaning to one side. Maybe the hand, you've got the thumb on the wrong side. Things like that we will spot right away when it comes back as a mirror Im image. So lots of art. And Norman Rockwell did that too. In his studio, he had a mirror Ooh. that he would pull out. It was a, kind of a vanity mirror and he would be able to see his composition backward. And if it was working backward, it was, it was a good composition. That's yeah. how he felt too. And one of my editors, I don't know how many people have ac access to a printer, but they will take their color artwork and put it on black and white in order to see the images, you know, where it blocks out on the page. So that would be another trick. I mean, it was a trick I should use because I'm, I love doing the details, but sometimes I lose it when it comes to the all over design. And that's where I rely on my art director, Marita. So back to your, going back to your question about, you know, self-publishing or, um, being found online, I just find the publisher is, um, you know, they're the experts. They've had so many books go uh, um, under the bridge that they will, they know what will work and what won't work. And um, you know, as I found even the sales force, they'll run it by the sales, like a title. Title is super important because um, it, it, the whole flavor of the book is going to be there. Like I, and I've always, there's a couple books that I didn't get the right title I wanted, and I've never been happy. So, <laughs> well, we are coming to the end of our hour. We can't thank you enough for this incredible program. I just want to end with one comment from Karen, who's an educator, who said that her class wrote letters to you because they love your book so much. And you were so kind to write back. And I have to just comment that. Um, it's been so inspiring to see your appreciation for your readers and how you interact with them and how interested you are in them. And that has been very inspirational to me. So oh, thank, thank you me. so <laughs> much, Jan. Um, and uh, we hope that all of you, if you're able, will come and visit the exhibition before it closes on March 6th. Wonderful. Jan, thank you again. We are so happy you were with us. Any thank closing you. comments? <laughs> and I what? Do you have any closing comments? Yes. I was just going to say, I have the best audience in the world, which are children, because we don't gain intelligence. We just gain experience as we grow older. But what children have is they have this air of discovery and vibrancy and want to learn as much as they can. And I'm able to be reflected and when they in that um, their energy when they look at my books. So what could be a better audience than children? And very discerning as well, because I can remember when I was six years old and feeling that um, I, having very strong opinions about my children's books. And I know that they do. And so it means so much to me when they will go to the library and choose one of my books or they'll talk their parent or grandparent or teacher into reading one for them. Well, there's so much love and appreciation, and uh, it's really been a thrill to have your work on view. We'll have uh, some wonderful uh, school vacation week programming uh, in February this month, so please join us. And as you can see on the screen, uh, you can find all that information on our website at nrm.org. Thank you again, everybody. It has been a great pleasure to spend this afternoon with you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you.